Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it makes you wish for a smaller room when there yeah. is maybe a decent number of people there. It's a bit sparse. I see. Yeah. The internet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I heard it was good, but I heard it was it was pretty eye opening. Sobering. Sobering, I guess is the right word. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> coming to terms. Coming to terms with disastrous stuff. A session, a session yet today? Yeah, we're just in Peak Planet. Oh, you're in Peak Planet, of course, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the Peak, peak Planet was in some ways reassuring, yeah. I thought. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I was, I was going to start off by saying it was reassuring on most counts except for, except for food. I know. Okay. Uh, yes, my mic is on. Um, well, welcome everybody to our session on Can Science Feed the World? Um, you know, we, we had a session earlier today on Peak Planet. And I have to say I came out of it feeling reassured on a number of points. Um, turns out we don't have to worry about a phosphate peak, um, for those who are worrying. Um, we have, we have options uh, for dealing with peaks in the various, various energy supplies. Um, but one set of numbers uh, that we heard in that session is really pretty worrisome. And, and those are the ones having to do with uh, population and food. Um, and they'll be familiar to most of you, uh, the idea that we'll have 9 billion people or so on the planet by 2050, uh, perhaps 10 billion by 2100. Um, those people are luckily getting richer and, uh, and developing a taste for meat, uh, as we in the developed world already have. Um, there's um, you know, plenty of agricultural production going to biofuels. Uh, and so all in all, the projections are that, that agricultural production will have to go up 70% by 2050 um, to feed the planet. And that's essentially another green revolution. Um, but, you know, the Green Revolution depended a lot on irrigation, uh, on big inputs of nitrogen fertilizer, among other things. And uh, it, it's not looking so easy this time around. Uh, water tables are dropping um, in many key areas, including the Punjab, northern China, um, the Great Plains. Um, overuse of nitrogen fertilizer is creating dead zones that are in coastal, coastal areas. So, so those tools will have to be used in, in new ways. Um, then on top of that, you have the wild card of climate change. Nobody knows quite how it's going to go, which areas are going to be hit, but there are already signs that it's cutting into um, production of, of some crops. Wheat and maize, a, st a study recently came out in science. Um, so, you know, taking all that into account, um, you know, people now talk about the need for sustainable intensification become a buzzword, um, but it means producing more uh, per unit of land, uh, but doing it in a sustainable way, in a way that doesn't, uh, doesn't take too heavy an environmental cost and, is, and can be continued for a long, long time. Um, so we have today a, a, a wonderful panel um, to discuss the question of how we can achieve enough sustainable intensification to feed 9 billion people. Uh, and what are, the, what are the technologies and practices that will, will make that possible? Uh, so I'd like to introduce our panel. Um, the far left is Dan Glickman. 
um, who is head of the Aspen Institute's congressional program. Uh, he was the Secretary of Agriculture from 1995 to 2001, and before that, uh, for 18 years, was a, a congressman from Kansas. Uh, next to him is Jerry Glover, um, who is a, uh, a fellow, a uh, science and policy fellow with the U U.S. Agency for International Development, um, and he's been um, head of the Ecosystem Research Program at the Land Institute in Salina, Kansas. Uh, he grew up on a, on a farm in eastern Colorado and uh, professionally has come back to what he, what he really loves. Um, uh, then we have uh, Paul Schickler, who is president of Pioneer Hybrid, which is uh, DuPont's um, advanced seed genetics business. Um, it's, a, it's an international company. They, they work with, with farmers in more than, more than 90 countries. Uh, he's been with Pioneer since 1974, and until 2007 was a, uh, vice president for, for its extensive international operations. And uh, just to my right is Roz Naylor, and Roz is director of the Program on Food Security and the Environment at Stanford, and uh, is also a professor of uh, Earth, you'll have to help me there. Environmental Earth System Science. Yes. Um, and she is an economist by background and interested uh, especially um, in the environmental and equity dimensions of, of food production. So I'd just like to, to kick, kick things off by asking each of the panelists to address um, really the big question, um, can we feed 9 billion people without destroying the planet? And what scale of trans transformation um, will be required to do that? Uh, Dan? Thank you. Um, what I, what I have here is a, what I, kind of the David Letterman list of the 10 giant challenges to the issue. That, and some of them are science, need science to solve them. Others are human capacity issues and infrastructure issues. But in addition, you know, you talked about doubling the food production or 70% more productivity and the equivalent of two Chinas over the next 35 years in population. We also have the other issue of price. That is, as it is with oil, the era of cheap food is over. And I don't know how high food prices are going to go, but we are in a much greater equilibrium of supply and demand on food. And so we're going to see much higher food prices, much more volatile food prices. And that's going to put great impact, particularly on low-income populations, both here in the United States and around the world. Given that, I, I view these as the big main challenges. Water, we've heard that at other places. 70% of the water in the world is used to irrigate crops. 30% is used for everything else drinking, industrial uses, and everything else. And with more and more people moving into urban America, urban, the urban world, whether it's here at home or overseas, it's hard to believe those folks are going to want to give up more of their water to grow crops. So that's an area where science can provide answers, is to have crops that are less water dependent and, and use water more efficiently. The amount of arable land in the world that's capable of increasing production is probably anywhere between 12 and 14 percent at a maximum. Much of that is in sub-Saharan Africa, but uh, how much land can you actually increase production on without tearing up the resources that we have is going to be a problem for policymakers. That's probably not a science issue except uh, providing increased yields on the land that we do have and growing crops that are sustainable is, is, is a science uh, issue. Research dollars to answer these questions. The amount of dollars that are going into public research in agriculture and food have been dropping over the last 30 and 40 years. There's, there is research dollars flowing in from um, uh, targeted, uh, uh, earmarked research, but the, the research that kind of developed the Green Revolution in the 60s, that is just falling down precipitously. And our science cannot answer these questions without more research dollars from all sectors from the public sector, the private sector, and the nonprofit world, especially the public sector. The U.S. government, uh, Brazilian government, has increased their research in agriculture much faster than we have in the United States. Uh, pests, with climate change changing so rapidly, pests and drought and temperature vi volatility will have a lot to do with whether we can produce crops around the world in the temperate climate and in the and the semi-arid climates. And there are a lot of challenges, particularly for wheat and rice. And those challenges are not just wheat rust in Ethiopia. They're wheat rust in the United States as well. And we're going to need science to help us meet those challenges, because <coughs> some thought a while back that that would wipe out the wheat crop in the world. And it probably won't, but those issues continue, as do issues of climate variability, 
and, um, uh, and carbon issues that will require us to use science to figure out what ways we can help folks uh, deal with these challenges. The other thing is the yield curve has been flat over the last five, six, seven years. We're not increasing product. We're, we increase productivity dramatically in the world for a long time. But the last five, six, seven years, we're finding that increases in yield in corn and wheat and, and the other commodities are just not going up as fast as it used to. Now, do we have a photosynthesis challenge or do we have a science challenge? I don't know the answer to that question, but to, to increase uh, productivity to feed all these people, it's going to be tough unless we find ways to produce more or eat less. And in some parts of the world, eating less is not an option. Maybe it is in the United States, it, it is an option. And finally, I just want to mention two issues that aren't science related. The one uh, uh, is the rule of law, which uh, in order to produce more crops in certain parts of the world that are in the developing side, if you don't have a rule of law or you don't have uh, uh, infrastructure, roads, or those kinds of things, or human capacity, all, all the science in the world isn't probably going to make that up, and we have to find ways to address these problems. So the final thing I would say is, is that, yes, science is desperately needed, but it is not the only answer to the problem. Jerry, what would you say to that? Well, uh, so I'll try and address more of the, um, I guess, ecological realities rather than the governance and policy issues. Just stepping back a little bit to think about the planet prior to agriculture, thinking about those various ecosystems from tropical rainforests to uh, the grasslands of North America. You know, these plant communities did a great job in general, given the particular circumstances of each location, in intercepting rainfall, letting it soak into the soil, storing it in the soil, and then using that water to take up nutrients and so on, trans transpire that water, and be very productive. And as a result, in most natural plant communities, we got very nice soil, clean water, and uh, good, at good air quality. So with agriculture, though, we changed that quite a bit based in large part due to the nature of the types of crops that we fundamentally rely on. And those are mainly the grasses and the legumes. Uh, and for our major grain crops, uh, they are all currently annual crops. So they're shorter lived, they require some disturbance in order to get established. Uh, their rooting depths are typically much shallower and their growing season uh, shorter, leaving the, the soil more vulnerable to uh, degradation, uh, less uh, uh, less effective management of the water, more runoff, more leaching below the root zone, and so on. So coming up in, in, in today's world where we're faced with the demand to increase yields or at least maintain them, we have widespread land degradation uh, due to some of the inherent characteristics of the major crops that we grow. Farmers are essentially trying to concentrate nutrients in plant material that humans can eat or that we can feed to our livestock and then harvest that and carry those nutrients off. It's a mining operation except insofar as we can recycle some of those nutrients back on or apply some fertilizers. Typically very limited number of nutrients are applied in fertilizers and we're now transporting off of these large landscapes a tremendous amount of nutrients long distances meaning that in many cases, we're not getting those nutrients back. And in the meantime, of course, water goes uh, unused uh, off the soil surface. And our productivity in many instances is quite low, much less than the actual yield potential of the particular crop. So that scenario offers many opportunities for science to intervene and come up with some elegant solutions. One, of course, comes out of my background, uh, particularly at the Land Institute, uh, which has been focused on developing perennial versions of the major annual grain crops that function much more like those natural plant communities in terms of intercepting and uh, letting water infiltrate into the soil, cycling of nutrients and so on, much deeper roots tapping into new sources of nutrients. We now have on, uh, it's, a, it's a reality that we have these new genomic tools in plant breeding and genetics that can greatly increase our ability to develop new crops with new traits, uh, 
uh, that can function much better than, than the ones that we currently often use. So just in thinking of how we're going to continue concentrating nutrients on landscapes for harvest and export, uh, it, it's going to be a tremendous challenge. I currently think that, that it used to be that it was clear that the governance issues, the social issues, were the biggest barrier to people having access to sufficient food. On many of the landscapes that, that we currently live on now, some marginal lands, mar the marginal landscapes of the world support more than 50% of the population. I think on those landscapes, we're increasingly up against biophysical limitations to concentrating nutrients in sufficient amounts to feed the, the people currently there and the projected uh, population increases in those regions. Uh, so we need some transformative approaches and solutions so that our, you know, we, we, we can complement our current crops, maize, rice, wheat, and so on, the sorghums and the millets, but add some new crops to the portfolio, giving farmers more options to produce greater yields under circumstances far less favorable than the circumstances they raised yields in during the last century. Well, what's your, your big picture of the kinds of changes we'll need to make to, to feed 9 billion? Well, um, part of it certainly is going to be science, and that's the name of the panel discussion here, and both uh, Jerry and Dan have already spoken to the role science plays. And I might say, you know, that, that is our business. I mean, DuPont is a science uh, company. The business that, that I am responsible for, the Pioneer Seed business, is clearly focused on plant genetics. So there's a role for science to play. But as I make my comments uh, today, I think there'll be two things that you'll continue to hear. One is you need to take that science to a very local level. That's where the problems, that's where the issues are. So you need to have a mechanism in which to take science to a local level. And then the other important message is you need to do it in partnership with others. We can bring science, but we can't bring all solutions, so it needs to be uh, very collaborative. Um, as it relates to science, um, the DuPont Company spends $1.7 $1 billion per year on research, and 60% 60, 60 of that is focused on food and agricultural production. So you can see that uh, you know, we, I think, can really bring science to part of the solution. But there's going to be two other things in addition to science. One is uh, that I already mentioned, and that is collaboration. And then one that uh, Dan alluded to, and that is infrastructure. So I'm going to speak real briefly to each of those three, science, uh, collaboration, and infrastructure. But what I'm going to do is, you know, instead of you know, talking about philosophy or, or concepts, give a real-life example in each of those three areas. I think sometimes we um, maybe talk too much and we don't uh, really drive things into actions. So maybe by using some examples, it'll give you some um, real-life uh, pictures of how science, collaboration, and infrastructure can, can make a difference. So first with science, you know, first of all, there's a whole array of science tools that you can use. You can start with uh, continuing to uh, make improvements in varietal crops, in hybrid crops, shifting people from open pollinated to hybrid crops, bringing advanced uh, molecular breeding techniques to get uh, a better outcome faster to uh, breeding practices. You can, you can utilize native trait technology to get the plant to express defensive characteristics that are already in the plant to have that expression level at a higher uh, level. And then, of course, transgenic technology to bring proteins from other species into plants to go after a targeted uh, issue. So it's a whole spectrum of alternatives. One size does not uh, fit all. So the example is uh, biofortified sorghum. Sorghum is a critical crop in sub-Saharan Africa. First of all, it survives and uh, yields under stressful conditions, so that is good. But then it's also very much a staple food to um, somewhere around a half billion Africans. So the project that we have is to bring biofortified nutrients to sorghum. And what that means, it, through transgenic methods, it is uh, increasing the level 
of uh, vitamin A, vitamin E, protein, iron, and zinc in sorghum. And it also enables the uh, nutrients to be more digested by the consumer instead of passing through. So that's a real life example. Uh, we are now in phase two of this project. The first phase was in partnership with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Phase two is now being supported by both the Danforth uh, Center as well as the Howard Buffett Foundation. But then more importantly, like I said, collaboration and um, localness. Uh, we're partnering with uh, CARI, the Kenya Agricultural Research Institute and the biosafety regulatory folks in South Africa uh, since this is a transgenic uh, pro product. So a real life example that hopefully will deliver important nutrients to African consumers and enable African farmers to grow that crop more successfully. The second area that I mentioned is collaboration. The example there um, that I would um, uh, speak about is uh, nitrogen utilization. And uh, this is an effort with um, um, also the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to bring enhanced nitrogen utilization to maize. We're, we're working not only with the uh, Gates Foundation, but also with CIMIT and other African organizations who have maize varieties that are adaptable to the local conditions in Africa. So we're combining their expertise of locally adapted maize to our expertise of making those maize varieties yield more. And then over time, we will uh, enable those pro pro products to be more uh, nitrogen efficient, requiring less fertilizer to be applied. And then finally, on the infrastructure uh, issue, um, Dan mentioned a couple uh, areas of infrastructure. But it's a, it's a real broad issue. You, you know, it, it is things like roads and bridge, bridges, bridges. It is uh, access to inputs and credit markets. Uh, but it's also things like um, government policy, the rule of law, land rights, um, market access, and, and so on. The whole set of things that make farming sustainable at the local level. So the example that I use about infrastructure is in the Philippines, we... Um, operate locally. We, we develop and produce seed locally for the Philippine uh, consumers. And in that, we're in partnership with seed growers who multiply our seeds. We bring them into our seed production facilities for multiplication before we sell them to uh, growers. Over time, uh, because this is an irrigated area in, in um, Mindanao, uh, Philippines, the area around uh, this is highly um, um, hills and valleys and has become eroded because of deforestation, uh, the land being cleared for other crops. Uh, all the rainwater comes down, uh, takes soil with it, uh, not only degradates the soil but then destroys the water canals for irrig irrigation and also reduces the water quality. So what we did in partnership with the local, both municipal and uh, provincial government is first reforested the hillsides, uh, then repaired the uh, water irrigation canals. Um, so over time, you had uh, better soil conservation, better water quality, and repaired irrigation systems. So then we could go back in, produce seed in this local community. Uh, the growers um, came out better. Uh, water supply improved, and as an outcome, we regained the use of this area in seed production. So with those three examples of science, collaboration, and infrastructure, I think that's the way that we need to look at these challenges um, about feeding the 9 billion people that we're going to have in, in uh, 2050. It is a combination of all three of those areas. Last. Yeah, <laughs> thank you guys for <laughs> taking all the space. Um, these are really interesting comments. And when I um, think about it, I, I think about 2050, but I think about today, and I think about 7 billion people, and are we even feed, feeding 7 billion people? And uh, sadly, we're really not even feeding 7 billion. There's uh, roughly a billion people living day in, day out without adequate 
uh, nutrition and without enough meals to get through the day and have an active working life. And so at the same time, we have this obesity challenge and, and a lot of environmental problems that have been put on the table. And so I guess today, I think we're sort of at a low point. And this is a good thing because we're all focused on this and it's time to... Uh, step up and not only reverse a lot of what we have going on today, but make the future path completely different with innovative thinking. Um, I'm very optimistic. One, all of you are sitting in here on this gorgeous day, and you could be out doing something better than thinking about this, but a lot of people today are thinking about uh, these challenges. And I think there's sort of a framework if you think about um, three different levels. One is trying to raise the yield ceiling. How do we get higher yields for all these basic staple crops that are feeding, you know, 50% of calories are rice, wheat, corn, you know, the basic staples. And um, how do we even raise the yield ceilings? Dan has talked about that. We need an incredible amount of investment that we're not seeing today. Agriculture has really dropped off the table, partially because prices for a long time had been declining in real terms, and people are just thinking there's plenty of food, we don't really need to invest in this. With the price spike in 2008, there was resurgence of investment in agriculture, and I would say the G8 is pretty much uh, waning on that, uh, committing things, not really sticking to those commitments and so forth. So I think we're at a critical time in terms of these investments right now. If you go to Nebraska, they're right up against the yield ceiling for corn, say. And so that's an area, uh, actually, they need higher yields to, to uh, they, higher yield ceiling to actually achieve more. They could do that. Most farmers need to do the second, which is close the yield gap. Most farmers are achieving 50%, 30% of what they could be achieving, and it's a, it's a much more challenging issue. It's not just a science issue, as Dan mentioned. It's one of infrastructure of credit. Do they have available inputs and extension and, and a marketing infrastructure to even have the incentives to want to apply inputs and get it to market? And so um, in that sense, uh, that yield gap question is a complicated one, um, but there's a lot of innovative work. As we're thinking about um, closing that yield gap, meaning that getting higher yields with the technologies we already have, part of it is using um, all of our inputs more efficiently. And there's a breeding question um, that has been put on the table in terms of breeding for nitrogen use efficiency. There's also a big area of management and the science of um, managing nitrogen fertilizers um, to get higher yields without adding any additional nitrogen is a big area of science that needs, I think, a lot of attention. China is one area. If you look at China, the northern plains there, they get among the highest yields of corn and wheat anywhere. Um, they use by far the most fertilizers, an uh, average of 350 kilograms of N per hectare per, um, per, per season. And it's just an enormous amount of N that is being used per year. Um, these studies show by the Chinese scientists that you could actually, by managing that nitrogen better, uh, the timing of nitrogen, the placement of nitrogen, um, using water more efficiently in the process, you could cut that nitrogen amount in half and not have any impact on yields at all. And so then it's an issue of can you get the, um, the economic interests, the political subsidies and so forth that are behind this use um, rearranged. And so that's a different social and economic question that goes along with it. Um, at the lower end of the spectrum, if you look at African farmers, there's, there's a completely different challenge that has been put on the table in marginal areas when you don't have enough inputs. And um, here, thinking about the science of um, crop diversification as opposed to trying to just work on these staple crops, what mixture of crops can you get distributed irrigation, what kinds of um, fertilizer, water use efficiency, are you able to get in these really arid environments are all kind of critical questions. I want to put another issue on the table in both closing the yield gap and raising the yield ceiling, and that is climate change, because as we move to the future, we're not only trying to undo some of the problems that we've had, but we're going to do this in an era of rapidly changing climate. And although we don't know all the specific areas, particularly on precipitation, all the climate models uh, do show a warming climate. And when you put all those climate models together, the 23 models in the IPCC together and look to 2050 and to the end of the century, um, the growing season temperatures, particularly in the tropics and subtropics, 
are going to be higher than anything that they've ever experienced in the last 100 years. They're going to go completely out of bounds of anything that has been known in the past. And so if we don't gear our science now to think about growing crops in a much warmer environment, um, I think we're really, really going to be stuck. And um, what's interesting about that is that we flatly do need to put genetically modified organisms on the table for discussion. And I think we should all take this up. There's ways to do stress tolerant breeding for uh, drought tolerance right now. Great work is being done by Simit in, uh, on corn by stressing out a crop under drought conditions. For heat tolerance, it's more difficult because you actually need chambers and you know, it's a different infrastructure that's needed and, uh, and, a, and a different set of uh, um, kind of criteria. It's not, it's not easy to do with classical breeding, and um, when you talk to the private companies, we've talked to Pioneer in the past, and they said, uh, how much uncertainty should we make this investment if we do? We're going to start with a genetic modification because it's the most logical approach, and, and it's hard to argue with that at one level. Um, it's a quantitative trait, involves a lot of genes, and it's really going to be difficult to do this with classical breeding. And so I think we need to anticipate where we're moving and decide what kind of, what kind of world uh, we're going to be looking at um, if we don't reverse climate change. The last, the last issue I'll put on, I just want to raise a couple, a couple of issues to make, make people a little uncomfortable, I guess, um, is that we have, over the past 50 years, gotten three quarters of our production gains out of intensification, getting higher yields on existing lands, and we would like to do that in the future. But the reality is we are expanding into new areas, and we're expanding today by about six million hectares in the developing world every year in a rainforest like Brazil and Indonesia for oilseed crops and for cattle and so forth. And um, land is the scarce commodity. It's the speculative commodity right now. People in hedge funds, people in governments, everyone's investing. The Stanford Endowment Fund is asking me, should I invest in land in Brazil or should I go to Uruguay? You know, and we're saying, you know, what is your intention? Is the intention really to invest in production agriculture that will help lift people out of poverty so they can afford to feed themselves and so forth? Or is it to just make a, a speculative gain and move to another area? And you're seeing all of that right now. 80 million hectares in recent past four or five years has been, um, has been bought in uh, mostly ha over half is in Africa and most of the remaining in Latin America and very murky land institutions behind this, and so I don't think we're really gonna know how that's all going to look in the future when those lands are uh, put into production. Um, I doubt they're gonna be smallholder agriculture. They're probably gonna be a, a whole variety of, <laughs> of different things. Um, but, but how we manage lands under this context, I think, is another challenge we're gonna face in the future. Yeah, I'd actually like to, to follow up on the, the land issue. I mean, <clears throat> Expanding into new land often means expanding into marginal land, and uh, and then there's also degraded land that's now pasture, might be put to a better use. I mean, what kinds of, of answers, what kinds of new technologies, what kinds of answers do, does science have uh, for moving into those kinds of lands without, you know, increasing soil erosion and release of carbon from the soil and all the all the bad things that can happen if you if you try to farm marginal lands. Do you want to start with that, Jerry? Or? Uh, sure. No, no, that, that would be good. Uh, can we have that slide up, please? As was pointed out, um, this idea that we might be, uh, in certain cases, well, in, in, in reality, we are expanding onto more marginal land, and by more marginal land, I mean lands that degrade fairly easily when we grow our uh, traditional crops on them. You know, again, going back to that idea that many of our cropping systems don't adequately protect the soil, don't adequately in intercept rainfall and keep it on the, on the landscape. For example, African agricultural systems are often only utilizing 10 to 30 percent of the natural precipitation with the rest running off or, again, uh, draining below the root zones. And yet they're in, co in, in frequent uh, danger of dying from drought stress. So if we can design agricultural systems that are much more effective at using the natural precipitation, we'll get much better nutrient uptake, much better response to any of the inputs that we put on them, 
and more biomass production below ground to help the soil health, and more biomass production above ground to not only produce those grains that we so dearly need, but also to provide uh, plant material for livestock feed. So on your right is one of our dominant annual grain crops, annual wheat. Those root systems stop about a foot, typically stop about a foot to two feet down into the soil. So that's a limited volume of soil and subsoil that that crop is able to tap into. I, I grew that wheat crop using best management practices uh, defined as conservation agriculture. I used no-till drills. I used um, good application of fertilizer, uh, crop rotations, and so on. But those surface impacts that, that we get that are good from using conservation ag largely are restricted at that soil surface. If we go down seven feet in the soil where there's still additional soil moisture, there's a lot of soil nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, so on, those annual crops don't, aren't, don't have access to that. Further, that crop is about to be harvested. <clears throat> in Kansas, where Dan and I are from, for example, we harvest our wheat in June. The land lies bare typically until a fall planting of wheat or sometimes clear through the winter until a spring planting of soybeans or sorghum or some other spring crop. It's a lot of bare soil. You can go to satellite uh, images of the Corn Belt of the U.S. and you're looking at hundreds of millions of acres of bare soil for, for lengthy periods of time. Severe rain events cause a lot of erosion and, and so we get that land degradation. That's even more important when we're talking about these sloping marginal lands where soil quality is often poor. On the left in this image, that's about a seven foot soil profile. And down here at the bottom, you see the roots still tapping into those resources down deep. This is a wild perennial relative of annual crop wheat, wheatgrass. <clears throat> and it produces a nice seed. Plant breeders are currently working to dramatically increase the seed yield. After just a few years, they're able to triple or more the, the yields and the seed size of, of wheatgrass just through traditional plant breeding um, uh, uh, work. The, the work that Roz and, and mentioned about transgenics and the genomic tools, those can greatly accelerate those efforts as well. But this is a system with much greater safety nets deep in the soil, really ready to spring into action anytime the, the moisture is available, nutrients av are available, and you know the air temperature is good. It's much more productive than annual wheat. And even when annual wheat's receiving high inputs of fertilizers, it grows more biomass. Once it's harvested for seed, the vegetation regrows and you can harvest it for livestock. So I think that's, you know, that's one example of, of how we can develop farming systems that are much more resilient to climate change by using what is on the farm more effectively and uh, pro producing more for the farmer. We talk about infrastructure to get inputs to the farmer. We also need to think about the biological infrastructure that can be developed on the farm to tap into those resources that are already there, namely sunlight, the natural precipitation, and the full soil profile. And that's especially critical when we're talking about these marginal landscapes. Yeah, I might mention that Jim Richardson, who took that picture, oh, yeah. is, is here, and, and not, maybe not in the audience, but he's going to be giving a presentation later. Uh, Dan, you had a I, comment. I just, just, uh, this is really as much a political issue as anything else. But one thing you have to realize is if we're in for an era of high commodity prices, double, triple, quadruple what we saw in the 1950s and 60s and 70s, and I think we're in that era, that means is that uh, price and economics are gonna, and shortages are going to determine a lot of what's happening in this area. So why is it that soybeans are expanded so dramatically in Brazil? Why? Because they're buyers. They're, 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 they're frenetically searching commodities to feed their animals and feed their people. And um, this is, it worries me because there isn't that much land. There's, there's some additional land, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, that I think can be expanded uh, safely. Uh, but uh, 
but this is why this has to be on the, on the international political agenda. This is not just a science issue. This is a political issue. And that is, is that how the countries of the world can meet to determine if there are efforts that we can to restrain putting additional land in production that not, ought not to be cultivated. And um, for the first time, I must tell you, in modern history, the administration is actually pursuing this agenda much more aggressively through a, a freshened up and more muscular agency for international development that's trying to in engage the rest of the world uh, in agriculture uh, uh, m much more positively. But, but without that effort, uh, as Willie Sutton was asked, why does he rob banks? Because that's where the money is. Why do people grow crops? Because that's where the money is. And so you, you're going to have to find some ways to restrain that collaboratively and through, uh, through the, an international uh, political system. Just a quick follow-up. Um, and I'm certainly not advocating bringing more marginal landscapes into production. One of my key concerns, though, for the near term, is to make sure that the marginal lands currently in production aren't so heavily degraded that then they are abandoned and farmers move on to even more marginal landscapes. So there, it, it is a rea reality that we must use some marginal landscapes, but it's also critical that we maintain the sustainability of those farming systems on those more marginal landscapes. For the longer term, I think the same principles apply. We've heavily degraded Iowa soils, the richest prime farmland in the world. So the, the longer term, we need to start also thinking about our non so-called non-marginal non landscapes, too. I'll, I'll just add three comments that sort of complement what both uh, Dan and uh, Jerry are speaking of. One is, you know, as far as bringing additional land in, I'm going to come back to the productivity issue, that if we can con continue to drive increased productivity off of the land that is already in production, that will help us from, that will prevent us from moving into more marginal lands that might be more uh, risky. The second uh, situation is, is that management practices can uh, be sa a significant contributor. Uh, Jerry mentioned uh, some of the cultivation practices, uh, either reduced till or no till, have a tremendous amount of ad advantage to keep soil intact, to keep moisture in the ground, and then also to put organic matter back into the soil so that it's uh, more sustainable. And then finally, uh, there are some new cropping patterns that can be explored. Uh, we've got a project in uh, Zambia with one of the CGIAR institutes to put combination maize production <laughs> with nitrogen fixing trees in alternate seasons so that the maize grows one season, then it's followed by the nitrogen uh, fixing trees that not only fix nitrogen, but also uh, uh, hold the soil together as well as uh, return organic matter also. And, and by the way, that system that he just spoke about, it, a type of evergreen agriculture has spread to some 5 million hectares in, in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa. So it's very impressive. Yeah, I think I, a lot of times when we're focused on feeding the world, we focus so much on the production side, and I think we need to focus on the demand side too, and I think this is where Dan was getting to a little bit, because one of the issues with perennials that makes it so tricky is that farmers like the flexibility of being able to respond to the market, and so they can work in some circumstances, and Jerry, you might um, narrow in on that a little bit more for um, American farmers that use futures markets and so forth. I mean, they like to be much more responsive to the highest price and being able to have that flexibility to meet market demand. The soybean issue in Brazil is a really interesting one because on the demand side, um, income, if you model this, income is by far the larger driver than population growth in terms of our food needs. And uh, most of it's coming from animal consumption, um, whether it's beef or it's chickens or hogs or now that you're growing fish and aquaculture industry, which requires crops as an input. And uh, the Brazilians see this perfectly clear that China, China's taking over half the soybean, uh, half the soybean exports went to China recently. I mean, it's phenomenal as they're increasing their meat consumption and their growth just continues to skyrocket. And so uh, these kinds of questions on the demand side and so meeting the kind of really innovative production systems that we have with what's happening on the demand side, I think, is, is going to be very critical. Yeah, I'd like to follow up a bit on this issue of, of meat. Um, you know, meat, meat production <laughs> consumes a lot of our, of our cereal production, also a lot of our land. I mean, are there 
models for more sustainable meat production that, that you know, sort of lighten the footprint a bit? Well, there's, there's a lot of attention. We, we have a lot of, um, at, at Stanford, there's a lot of food conferences, and everyone's interested in local, sustainable, grass-fed, everything. But um, actually, one of my students has been working on this, and to feed the U.S. demand for beef um, by, con you know, just by grass-fed. If you converted all of our feedlot into grass-fed and then took the crop production that feeds the feedlot and put that all into grass-fed, you know, how much more land would you need for this whole thing? And you need 63% more land <laughs> than we are currently using. It's not really going to be feasible, unfortunately, you know, bigger than the size of Texas. And so without actually curbing our demand, you know, cutting our meat consumption way down, we're never going to actually get there. There has been unbelievable in g gains in uh, livestock science over the past several decades. I mean, the uh, the yields, whether you're talking about meat or the reproduction of broiler chickens or hogs and their litter sizes. I mean, there's, you can go on and on. It's been really phenomenal. These have been very intensive systems that do have a lot of uh, environmental ramifications to them. And I think that if we could, um, could steer some of these uh, science activities towards, say, grass-fed beef, could we get pasture productivity up? kind of link the kind of uh, work that Jerry's doing with livestock science to get um, animals that emit less gas as they're consuming grass and so forth to cut the greenhouse gas emissions. And there's r virtually no real science done in this other aspect of, uh, of livestock that, that might be more environmentally sound. But again, we're not gonna we're not gonna do it on our current diets. I mean, we really, as a whole, Americans consume 125 kilograms of meat per capita per year. It's almost 50 percent higher than Europe, and it just out you know just outscales every other country in the world. And so, even a few a few more vegetarian meals would be helpful, actually, on our side. But, but the thing is, to some extent, our system of meat production in this country, which is industrialized was based upon an industrialized grain production. Uh, and our farm programs have been geared largely, and they've been based on very cheap grain prices is what, what we've had. And that's, uh, that's one, one of the big factors that's allowed the massive expansion of our meat production. And I'm, you know, I don't comment on the, what's good or bad for you, but I will have to tell you that if we're entering an era of high grain prices and high fuel prices, I suspect it will dramatically impact the future of the meat industry in this country. The marketplace will probably have some impact on that. So I'll take this issue one step further, uh, because we've alluded to it. Um, Ross spoke very well about uh, improvements in livestock management and uh, productivity, uh, the challenge of grassland versus uh, confined uh, spaces. Uh, we also alluded to China as the future issue. So. Yes, um, we have diet issues in the more developed world, but as the underdeveloped world um, improves their economies, their diets are going to improve at the same time, uh, moving from cereal-based to more of a protein-based diet. So just a t statistic to keep in mind, um, 10 years ago, uh, China imported no soybeans. Today, uh, China is importing 55 million metric tons the entire production of Brazil. Now, some of it comes from Brazil, some from the United States, uh, but basically consuming the entire amount of Brazil soybean production. Today, China is starting to demand more corn or maize imports as well. So we're sort of at the forefront of the next stage of China's uh, demand for food security and improved diets uh, to, to plenish that uh, demand for increased protein as their economic conditions rise. And the issue of livestock probably highlights some of the great differences between the developed world and the developing world. In Africa, it would be probably, well, I'll just say what uh, the International Livestock uh, Research Institute, which is based in Africa, how they see it. Basically, many in Africa need to increase their meat consumption. It's a vital source of protein and, and nutrients. And if we look out up to 2050 or so, there will be a need to roughly double the amount of livestock production in many parts of Africa. Not because they're getting wealthier and it's a luxury item, but because of the growing population and it's a critical health component. Uh, it's a critical part of their diet. 
the, the extensive pasture lands and grazing lands are largely tapped out in terms of getting more production out of them. So ILRI, this, this International Livestock Research Institute, projects that this near doubling of livestock production will need to come from residues from the crop fields or some part of the cropping systems themselves, the highly managed, intensively uh, produced croplands rather than these extensive pasture lands. That puts in even greater burden on farmers to produce more biomass from the sunlight, from the water, from the soil, uh, so that they not only harvest the grains that they directly eat, but so that they can produce enough plant material to feed their, to their livestock and maintain enough residue on the soil to protect it. So that's where, again, I, I see we need to come up with some very transformative systems capable of uh, uh, much greater use of the on-farm resources in addition to the uh, purchased inputs that, that are also going to be critical. So I'd like to get back to this issue of genetic tools. And, and I think everyone on the panel is in agreement that you know we need them all, including transgenic technologies um, you know, for certain for developing certain kinds of crop traits. But I, I think a, a common criticism of the research that's been done and the products that have been produced by the big, big agrobiotech companies is that you know, they've concentrated, of course, on, on things that are most valuable to the farmers in the developed world, um, herbicide resistance and, and, and pest resistance and so on, and the, and the kinds of technologies that would be most useful for the developing world, drought resistance, um, the enhanced sorghum that you were talking about. Um, and others have been very slow in coming. And first of all, I wondered if that is a, is a fair point. And second, what, what are the reasons for it? Why is it taking so long? Uh, and I guess it's mainly a point okay. of question for you, Paul. <laughs> um, first of all, the um, uh, biotechnology traits that have been brought to the market so far um, were ones that um, served a pretty significant need, meaning large <laughs> and serious, uh, insect damage and uh, weed control that competes uh, for nutrients and water. Um, and also were, from a technology standpoint, easier to solve than, as Roz suggested, uh, drought is a much more complex uh, issue to solve uh, transgenically. Uh, now, that's not to say we, we have uh, significant work on, on drought tolerance, nitrogen utilization, and some other things, it is just taking longer um, because they are more challenging issues. Um, but a couple of points is that, you know, whether we um, look at uh, a farmer in Brazil or Argentina or Vietnam or uh, the Philippines, those transgenic capabilities are scalable. They, they work effectively with small farmers, uh, uh, smallholders, as well as uh, larger commercial farmers. Um, and then we do have a product that is, in fact, going to be commercialized in 2012 that brings increased nutrition to soybeans, um, basically an oil profile that is similar to olive oil and no trans fat uh, when it's um, uh, put through processing. And then from a utilization standpoint, more stability um, for fryers. Um, and comes with no agronomic shortcomings, which has also been a problem so far as when you're trying to uh, get the plant to respond to some output trait like an improved oil, it normally comes with an agronomic deficiency. This doesn't. So my point is, is that uh, there are a lot of opportunities out there. We're going after many, um, but uh, that comes back a little bit to the uh, collaboration effort as well. We can't do it by ourselves. I just, I, I've often said that if you could come up with something that would grow hair, there would be significant support in this country uh, uh, from, from some of us, certainly. But, you know, uh, first of all, I think that uh, your, your company and, and some of the others have moved quite well. The, the beginning of this era, however, was not necessarily, I'd call it, the best uh, laid plans of mice and men. I think industry overpromised on GMOs. They, they were resistant to effective regulation. Uh, but that's changing now. Uh, it's changing here in the U.S. It, it, and there were also the issues of intellectual property rights and, and how uh, small farmers were going to be dealt with around the world. But, but I think now, that, uh, so what that did is that created on the other side this just kind of genetic resistance 
to, to, to anything that was genetic uh, in terms of breeding techniques that where you take one species and transplant it into another species. I think most people now believe that, in fact, with good effective regulation and with sensible corporate practices, that, in fact, this can have a, uh, a dramatic impact, particularly if, if the science is there, which, is, which it now is. But, uh, um, and I don't think this ought to be the heart of the debate now. When I was in Africa and Mozambique, I had a farmer tell me, he says, well, I'd use GMOs if, is, if I could, but right now I just need to get my yields up by one uh, ton per hectare, and I don't care how it happens because I just need to get it done. And in his case, he doesn't need GMOs. He needs some fertilizer and better seeds and some, and some human capacity management extension type work to do that kind of stuff. But, but we're clearly going to need these new technologies to, yeah. to feed the world. But we should probably open it up to questions now. We barely scratched the surface of this issue. But, uh, um, and uh, let's see, there should be a microphone. Yes. Um, so please, please go to the mic, I guess uh, whoever, whoever gets there first, um, and say who you are. Ah, good. Uh, hi, my name is Jason Jay from MIT. Um, so this is a panel that, that's about uh, can science feed the world? And I'm, I guess my concern about the conversation is I feel like science is being defined fairly narrowly in the sense that we're mainly talking about biotechnology and crop science. And I feel like there's a broader ecological science that maybe could be brought into the conversation, particularly around the issue of that a lot of the technologies and science we're talking about ends up still advancing a kind of monocropping um, and lo relatively low biodiversity on farm and surrounding farms. And an ecological science approach might say, okay, that's gonna improve the efficiency of these systems, but maybe not the resilience of these systems um, that a more biodiverse type of approach might, might provide. So if we think about an ecological science approach and kind of trade-offs between efficiency and resilience, would that lead us down a different path of thinking about science and feeding the world in a sustainable, resilient way, particularly given the uncertainties we have around the effects of climate on agriculture. And um, I guess I'm just kind of, you know, again, speaking to what we had about the bio, which particular biotechnologies have we applied, it's, you know, resistance to particular, um, you know, pests and, and crop plagues, which are in part, you know, maybe we'd be less vulnerable to that if we had a more diverse biodiverse cropping system. I'm, I'm just want to bring that into the conversation and see what the panelists yeah. think about that. Could I address that? Yeah. Uh, and this will address, I think, somewhat Raza's comment about yeah. flexibility in the cropping system and, and hit on a few cross-cutting themes. Resilience, risk, uh, climate change, household nutrition. Uh, the, uh, one, one other thing that we haven't mentioned here is the, the very large part that female farmers play around the world, uh, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, where they're not only heads of households responsible for the nutritional health of their children, but also the managers of these, of these farming systems. So I'll just use a, an example in Malawi, where I think that, that they achieved you know, the old win-win situation where there wasn't a trade-off. Uh, maize, soybean systems managed by managed often by uh, female household heads. Poor soil conditions in need of fertilizers that are often expensive unless they're subsidized, which those prog programs are often short-lived. And just poor soil health overall. Got to maintain the maize yields because that is really the backbone of that farming system. But we also need more uh, nutritionally rich foods for the household and we need more nitrogen into that system. Siglinda Snap, a Michigan State University uh, research scientist and others, had spent 10 years there investigating different farming systems. Biodiversity was a critical aspect of sustainably maintaining the yields of that maize. So in this maize soybean system, a two-year rotation, they integrated a perennial pigeon pea from which the farmers could get two harvests of pigeon pea, the harvest of maize, and the harvest of soybean. It was intercropped in there, so you have greater diversity. You have a longer duration legume, so you're able to put more nitrogen into that system and thereby reduce the, the fertilizer inputs. So the basic 
um, you know, wrap up of, of that project was some 10,000 or so farmers adopting that system, twice the carbon and nitrogen storage in the soils due to the integration of that perennial type of pigeon pea. They did household surveys of, of diet. You get enhanced protein because you have two more harvests of a protein source. Maize yields were the same, half the fertilizer inputs, and you get the same soybean yields. And, and so now let's talk about risk reduction, resilience, climate change, and so on. Much greater use efficiency of the nitrogen that was applied, better use of the water, the natural precipitation, because throughout the entire phase of that farming system, you have living plant cover. Some of it's from the annual crops, some of it's from the perennial crops. You also get reduced labor inputs per unit harvest, which is very important for those female household heads. Um, uh, yield stability was greater. Because there was greater protection of the soil, better use of, of uh, the natural precipitation, better use of the fertilizers, yields were more stable. So I think there are those, and, and that's an example of what I would think of as a transformative system. And, and also, I might just say, our U.S. farm programs since the 30s have been monoculture oriented. In fact, we penalized farmers. They weren't eligible for the payments from the federal government if they shifted crops because they had to protect a crop base. And that base then was the basis upon which they got their payment in future years. Uh, that's been changed a little bit. We permit a little more flexibility among cropping, but it's still fourth crops. You can switch from corn to soybeans uh, and feed grains, but that's it. So under our current programs, you cannot grow fresh fruits and vegetables on program crop acres. So if you grow wheat, and if you want to grow tomatoes on that wheat acres, you will lose your entire payment for the whole wheat acreage because of that. So, so I suspect that's going to change in the years to come. But it's, it, it's kind of a U.S. model of what Jerry just talked about. Well, thanks. Um, let's uh, alternate microphones. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, in looking at the need to feed 9 billion people, I looked at the projections made by FAO about how much uh, food is needed in terms of calories. And to my great surprise, I found that their estimate is based on more than 3,000 calories per person. And the little I know about nutrition, people don't need that amount of calories. Uh, they will all grow fat if they actually get them. So when I asked why that was done, and I, I haven't asked the people that did the projections, but people that know about food said, oh, because we know that a third of the food is wasted. So in everything that you've talked about, I wonder what's, none of you have mentioned the problem of wastage. And what can science do in order to prevent that wastage? And it goes together with the next question. We know that at this moment there are a billion people that probably are not eating enough, and we have probably two billion that are eating too much. So the science of nutrition, I think, hasn't merged well enough with the science of production. And, it's, and that science of nutrition goes with the uh, industrial production of food, which is one of the ways we're getting our food processed. Uh, and it's ironic that in the developed world we have usually to pay more for food that has less of the bad things. So is there any thought being given to how to balance those things? Uh, I don't think China is going to do very well by eating a lot more meat. And if one starts uh, making people know, uh, um, aware of the problem that good nutrition doesn't necessarily mean the nutrition in the West, that might be a good idea. Uh, well, you know, those are great comments. Um, I, I think one of the most promising things was after the midterm election when it seemed like the Obama administration couldn't get any legislation through, the first thing that passed was a school lunch program to revise diets and, or uh, the nutrients that s the schools feed kids here, which I thought was a very promising thing that we're recognizing it in this country, Republicans and Democrats alike, that this is a a problem that needs to be addressed that we need to be at the at the lead of really transitioning. So that's good, but you know, there's a huge lag now with China, Brazil, you know, all these countries that are following our initial footsteps and have no, no sense of that uh, bringing nutrition back into the conversation again. And I, we have a long way to go in this country, but I think I, I see the seeds of this all over the all over the country in terms of the dialogue in school lunch programs on up. And I think that's where you really do want to hit hit it hard because if kids uh, can adopt the right sense of diet, uh, 
in nutrition, they bring it back to their families. They're the ones that go to the grocery store, I want this, this, and this. And I think that's, that's a really good start. But I do worry uh, about the Chinas of the world and so forth, because I don't think this is part of it. I just say, we have, there's a gentleman tomorrow, he's in the back of the room, named Robert Egger, and he has something called DC Central Kitchen. And his whole means of doing business is what, how to deal with food waste. And uh, you know we throw away about uh, what is it, 100 billion pounds of, of food a year in this country alone, thrown away in the garbage. So he's he's made the study of how you deal with that particular issue. But I, I will tell you something that's interesting. Uh, the di dietary guidelines were written by our government to advise people on what to eat. They have nothing to do with our agriculture policy. So one of the things that we've thought about is a research study to show how you would produce food to meet the dietary guidelines. And I suspect you would have a revolutionary change in the, in the kind of food that's produced. Now, in our country, you give people those choices to do those kinds of things. Just today, the administration announced a new, they got rid of the food guide pyramid, they announced today, and they're going to a, a plate where they're gonna have a pie chart. I don't know if it's gonna be any more enlightening than the previous food guide pyramid, but I think the point's next. And, and one more to add to that, because you do raise some uh, interesting points. In addition to the waste in developed countries, which e your, your quantity equates to about 30%, I believe, yeah. uh, Dan, that number is the same in the developing world, 30%, but no, it's not waste, it's spoilage and transportation. Mm -hmm. So it's a huge opportunity to go after. One more question. Um, I, I've heard both sides of the productivity equation as it relates to small farms, that small farms are highly productive um, and uh, that small farms uh, lose in, com in competition with large farms. And uh, I was wondering whether you could uh, sh shed light on this and whether there are differences around the world. Do small farms serve some parts of the world but they don't serve other parts of the world? Um, are they highly productive? Um, in uh, peasant economies, or are they uh, lower productive? And uh, I would just like to know uh, what the world would get by consolidating the, f the, uh, the small farms or by breaking up large farms. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I, I'll, I'll start, but others can, and can chime in. I mean, um, it's highly variable. It, in, in a general sense, if you have a small farm and all have access to the same inputs, you can work that land better and should have higher yields on a smaller farm. Um, but not everyone has the same access to inputs, whether it's water, fertilizer, credit, uh, knowledge, transportation, all of, all of those things. In Africa, for example, East and Southern Africa, there's been a number of studies that have taken the smallholder sector, which is five hectares or less, and 2% of those farmers are selling 50% of the market. And then you know there's another 30% that are selling maybe 300 kilograms, just marginally into the market any, any given time, and the rest are actually net purchasers. And so it's really who has the better land, who has um, access to uh, the fertilizers and, and some water and, and so forth. So, you know, it's highly in, unequal in a lot of different places. Agronomically, small, farmer, small farms can do, can do great, it's, it's, uh, um, but it's highly, highly variable depending on, on access. I think whether we break up all the large farms, you know, the big debate in Africa right now is whether smallholder agriculture is uh, just never gonna work and let's just have large corporate farms come in and employ all these people. This is Paul Collier, you know, who's a big development expert and, and we're saying, what happened, you know, what was he, what's he on? You know, because those small farmers are gonna lose, you know, lose all the access they have to, any any kind of land and and uh, and rights and so you know, I I just think the inequalities are going to get much more much much worse actually under that kind of a scenario. And defining yeah. what you mean by smallholder, the scale is important. If you have a half a hectare and you need to divide it up between four children, that's probably not going to be very yeah. viable. But you know, uh, so it's smallholders can be a big range. Mm -hmm. Roz mentioned earlier uh, that China is, you know, one of the more productive areas in the world. Uh, the average farm size in, in China is about a half hectare, uh, but their productivity levels are about 80% of uh, the developed world. So maybe the last comment I'd make on this subject is we need to make sure that we don't get into debate of, you know, that one system is better to the exclusion of another. 
uh, large, small, small, smallholder farmers, organic farming, uh, conventional farming versus transgenic farming. You know, I think the important point is there, there needs to be a place in our food and agriculture system for all types of uh, farming and food production if we're going to solve the challenges that we face in the future. And, and I would just add, yeah, just one, one final go comment. government yeah. policy has a big impact on this issue of small versus large farms. And uh, in our country, I think that government policy ha hasn't driven small farms out of business, but has encouraged larger farms because of the subsidies. The more you grow, the more the subsidy. Uh, I suspect that that era is probably going to be changing because of the massive budget crisis we have in this country and in the developed world everywhere and high prices. And high prices will probably mean less subsidies. And so, uh, ironically, the marketplace will have probably more to determine about this than the government policy will in the future. Yeah. Well, listen, I think, uh, I think we've run out of time and we've explored a lot of interesting issues. I want to thank, thank the panelists for a great discussion. <laughs>